Lin Di Su Lido was born on January 31, 1956, in the city of Lancaster, state of Pennsylvania. She was the daughter of Wayne Lido and Eleanor G.C. While Lindy was finishing high school, she met a young man named Philip Douglas Bickler. Later, the two began a relationship, and in October 1974, when Lindy was 18 years old, they were married. After their marriage, Lindy became Mrs. Lindy Sue Bickler. The couple moved into a house of Millersville Road, still in Lancaster. Their routine was very similar to the routine of most couples. The two left for work in the morning, and Lindy usually arrived earlier and took opportunity to prepare dinner. It is said that they got along very well and made plans to have children, but unfortunately, they didn't have time for that. On December 5, 1975, a Friday, Lindy left for work around 5.45 in the afternoon and stopped by her husband's work, where she collected his paycheck. From there, she went to the bank and deposited her husband's salary and hers. Leaving the bank, Lindy went grocery shopping at John Harris Village Market and spent $46 on household goods. From the timeline, it would be believed that Lindy got home around 6.30 or 7.00 pm. Earlier that day, she had arranged with her aunt and uncle to meet at her house around 8.30 pm to exchange recipes, a hobby she had. Around 8.42 pm that night, Lindy's aunt and uncle arrived at her house to find a horrific scene. As soon as they entered the house, they saw blood all over the place, and as they got inside and went around looking for Lindy, they saw that the place was a mess, as if a fight had happened there. They found Lindy in the living room, lying on her stomach with a bladed weapon stuck in her neck. Desperate with that, Lindy's uncles immediately called the police. One of the first officers to arrive at the scene was Lieutenant Harvey West, and according to him, Lindy had been the victim of a brutal crime a crime he had seen only a few times in his many years of career. At the scene, police officers found out that the criminal used two knives that belonged to the victim's own kitchen kit. Also, there was a towel around the handle of one of the knives. The criminal probably didn't want to leave his fingerprints. The groceries Lindy had shot were still on the kitchen table. Also in the kitchen, there was a bloody footprint that made it clear that the person responsible for the crime was a man. The police analyzed all the shoes in the house, and none were compatible with the footprint. When checking all the doors and windows of the property, the police realized that none of them showed signs of break-in or forced entry. With that, the officers theorized that the criminal had followed Lindy while she was on the street, and then entered the house after approaching her. There was also the theory that the criminal could be someone Lindy knew, and she let him into the house because she already had a certain trust in that person. During the autopsy, it was revealed that Lindy had 19 puncture wounds on her body, most of which were on her chest, abdomen, back, and neck. She also had several defensive wounds, which indicated that she had fought for her life against her assailant. Still according to the necropsy, Lindy had been the victim of forced relations and the cause of death was due to a large hemorrhage caused as a result of her multiple injuries. Police officers were able to collect DNA and male fluid that were found in the victim's pantyhose. Although at the time, 1975, there was still no adequate technology to analyze the samples and make comparisons, the detectives made a point of cataloging and storing as much evidence as possible, which would help a lot in the future. Lindy's case made headlines in all the newspapers, mainly because it was a terrible crime that took place in an upscale neighborhood that was considered very safe. On December 9th and 10th, Newspapers reported that police were looking for a car that had been seen near where Lindy lived. Some witnesses said they saw this car between 7 and 8.45 on the night of the crime. However, the car was a common model, also of a common color. It was the type of car that you would find anywhere, and as there was no license plate or anything specific that could differentiate and facilitate the location, this information was not very useful. As usually happens in these cases, the first suspicions fell on Lindy's husband, Philip Pickler, but soon it was confirmed he was working at the time of the crime, so he was ruled out as a suspect. In testimony, Philip said he believed the perpetrator had been following him and Lindy for some time. He also said he was devastated by what had happened, and that he didn't know what his life would be like without Lindy from then on. A friend confirmed that 10 days earlier, Lindy had said that she felt she was being followed by a man. As the days went by, 
the population began to pressure the authorities to resolve the case as soon as possible, as everyone felt they were also at risk. With that, on December 16th, the Lancaster County District Attorney announced that he would put more police officers to work on the case in search of a faster result. However, from the beginning, the police had had a hard time getting clues that could lead to the perpetrator. In the months that followed, the police did everything in their power at the time, interviewing more than 250 people who might have been involved in the crime. The detective's main theory was that the criminal was someone who lived close to Lindy, but since there were no clues that could lead them to the person, the case ended up going cold. On December 26, 1976, Lindy's family informed the authorities that the young woman's tombstone had been vandalized. The vandal splashed red paint in the tombstone and chipped and slashed it, as if to represent what had happened to Lindy. On January 5, 1977, the police received an envelope written urgent. Inside that envelope was a letter that said that the same person who vandalized the tombstone was the perpetrator of the crime against Lindy. Detectives investigated these allegations and concluded that the information was untrue and possibly a hoax. There was a lot of other information in that same letter, however, it had not been released to the public. The time passed and the detectives didn't get any more evidence or any new clues, and with that, the case was closed. Almost 10 years later, in January 1984, then Lancaster County Prosecutor Michael Rank paid $2,500 to the Mobile Society in Los Angeles for two psychics to investigate the disappearance of Evelyn Fisher, a 14-year-old girl who disappeared in 1980, and the crime of Lindy Sue Bickler. On some occasions, detectives ask psychics to evaluate some cases so that they can present a new perspective and perhaps help in some way. The psychics would have said that the vision they had of the author of the crime against Lindy was that he would be a man with dark or brown skin, dark hair and eyes, and had a tattoo on one of his arms. This information was vague, as there were thousands if not millions of men in the same description in the region where the crime occurred, and thus, detectives could not advance in the case. In April 1989, detectives attempted to use new DNA technology to analyze a dry drop of blood that was found at the scene. However, the sam could not be analyzed due to it being too deteriorated with age. In June 1992, the case was handed over to new detectives who made it a priority to look into all of Lancaster's cases that had not yet been solved. With a new group of detectives and a new way of examining evidence, both Lindy's family and those following the case were hopeful that this time the authorities would catch up with the perpetrator. However, even with this new team and new technologies, the investigations made very little progress. In 1997, Lindy's underwear was sent for a new DNA analysis, and with that, they were able to establish a DNA profile using the male fluid that was in these clothes. In the year 2000, with the advancement of technology, a database was created to store DNA from criminals, and the profile collected from Lindy's clothes was entered into this database to find out if there was any correspondence with any criminal, but unfortunately there wasn't. Between 2000 and 2006, Lindy's case was reviewed and analyzed by other groups of detectives, including a specialized group from the FBI. But like the others who had already investigated the case, they also failed to advance the investigations. In 2007, Linda's brother had a huge billboard put up on the highways with pictures of his sister so that everyone would remember the case. He urged anyone who knew anything to get in touch with the authorities. On June 26, 2018, news broke that police had charged Raymond Howe, 49, who was known as DJ Fizz, with forcing relations and taking the life of a young woman named Christy Mirak on December 21, 1995. In the news, they said that the authorities were able to reach Raymond through genetic genealogy, a new technology that was being used for numerous purposes, among them identifying criminals in cold cases. Upon seeing this report in the news, Philip Pickler, Lindy's husband at the time of the crime, thought that perhaps the same technology could help solve Lindy's case. In the same year, Lancaster authorities requested the help of Parabone Nano Labs, a company focused on genetic genealogy based in Virginia and the same one that helped solve the case of Christy Marek. With the DNA that was found at Lindy's crime scene, they were able to trace a genealogical profile of the criminal. They studied geographic patterns of immigration, as well as surnames associated with locations, and determined that the owner of the DNA had ties to a small town Gasparina, 
which was in the Calabria region in southern Italy. It was determined that around 2,300 people with Italian genetic traits lived in Lancaster County at the time of the crime. This greatly reduced the number of people who should be investigated, as the investigation was restricted only to men or adults at the time of the crime. So, out of those 2,300 people, detectives were able to narrow that number down considerably. On September 5, 2019, detectives released two images generated from data obtained from DNA samples collected from the crime scene in 1975. The images were something that would be similar to the appearance of the criminal between the ages of 25 and 65, because it was not known his exact age when he committed the crime. As the experts narrowed down the names of possible suspects to the traits they had obtained through the DNA, they finally came up with one name, David Sinopoli. The police began investigating David and discovered that he had lived very close to Lindy at the time of the crime. For the first time in over 35 years, the police finally had a plausible suspect. To be sure that the perpetrator was David, they needed to test his DNA against the DNA collected at the crime scene. From that moment on, the police began to watch him. On February morning 2022, David was having coffee with his wife at an airport in Philadelphia. After finishing the coffee, David discarded the cup that was immediately collected by the police without him seeing it. The cup was sent to a laboratory that performed DNA tests. In April 2022, test results determined that the cup contained a single DNA and that it was male. That DNA was passed on to Cybergenetics, a Pittsburgh-based lab specializing in DNA comparisons. Cybergenetics analysis determined that the DNA in the coffee cup matched the male fluid collected from Lindy Sue Bickler's underwear in 1975. The new detectives who were now in charge of the case looked through the files to see if any drops of blood that didn't belong to the victim had found at the crime scene. In those files, they found two drops that were in Lindy's pantyhose. These two drops were also sent to Cybergenetics for analysis, and in July 2022, the results were found to be compatible with the DNA from the cup and the male fluid found in the victim's underwear. On the morning of July 17, 2022, 68-year-old David Sinopoli was arrested, accused of being the author of the crime against Lindy Sue Bickler. Lindy's family and her ex-husband Philip were finally able to celebrate after nearly 50 years. David Sinopoli is currently being held without bail in Lancaster Prison. On October 18, 2022, David denied all charges and pleaded not guilty. His preliminary hearing was held on September 23, 2022 and his formal hearing is scheduled for October 28, 2022. So far, it is not known exactly how David entered Lindy's house and committed the crime, as he pleads not guilty. For nearly 50 years, the Lindy Sue Bickler case has left police officers puzzled over who could be the perpetrator. But thanks to the advancement of technology, the criminal was finally caught in 2022, and now he will surely get a well-earned sentence. Obviously, this won't bring Lindy back, but it will at least give some relief to the family members who have waited a long time for this. Well guys, that's it for today. Thanks for watching until the end, best wishes, and I see you next time.